Welcome back, everyone. We'd like to start the conference again. So the new um, new topic will be uh, sorry, same topic <laughs> from <laughs> Professor Hidenori Arai, the National Center of Geriatrics and Gerontology in Japan. The promotion of the physical and mental health of older adults in order to build a society of healthy longevity. Professor, uh, please. thank you for kind of introduction. Uh, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's my honor to be here uh, to make a presentation. And also, I'd like to thank the organizers for uh, giving us a great opportunity to discuss about healthy aging and longevity in the beautiful island of Okinawa. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, mainly a frailty in older people and how to address uh, frailty. Okay, uh, this is my disclosures. Uh, actually, we have six national centers in Japan, uh, and like a National Cancer Center, a National Center for Global Health and Medicine, and this is for pediatrics, and this is neurology, psychiatry, and cardiovascular center in Osaka. So ba basically, we have four national centers uh, in Tokyo, one each in Osaka and Nagoya. Uh, our center, National Center for Geriatrics and Gerontology, which is kind of a N uh, NIA in the States, but uh, we have a hospital and research institute at the same time. Uh, that's the difference from NIA, I'm afraid, I, I think. So the um, mission of our center uh, is to promote the physical and mental independ independence of older people. The main target uh, of our research are dementia and general science. Uh, for these two targets, uh, we have uh, we are taking a multidisciplinary approach like uh, clinical practice, uh, science, uh, uh, medical uh, genome center is uh, working on the uh, database of uh, genome. Uh, we have two basic science center. One is for general science and the other is for dementia basic research. And also we have a, a, a epidemiology center and technology center like robotics. So uh, we are uh, actually um, uh, encouraging the collaboration between the two or more centers among our center, uh, especially uh, with the clinic uh, hospital because we have a fair amount of uh, patient data in our hospital. Uh, this slide shows the um, aging tsunami in Japan. In 1950, uh, the uh, proportion of older people was just 4.9 percent. However, in the year of 2022, the proportion of older people was 29.1 percent, and the proportion of older people over 75 years old was 15 percent. In addition, the number of centenarians in Japan is now more than 90,000 people. So the aging is, you know, going to uh, move like this. And 20 years later, 40% uh, of older people, uh, our population will be 65 years or over. 25% uh, of our population will be 75 years or over. And almost 10% of the population should be, will be uh, 85 years or over. So it's um, you know one of the uh, uh, huge challenge in terms of the uh, global aging. Uh, Japan has a leading the uh, world in terms of aging. Uh, in the morning, uh, Noriko uh, uh, mentioned about the cause of disability. Uh, this slide showed the top co five causes of disability in Japan, and uh, uh, as you can see in this slide, uh, the the top cause of disability used to be stroke when we started the long-term care insurance system in the year of 2000. But now the top causes of disability is dementia, followed by stroke, senile weakness, falls and fracture, and joint disorder. So these three, third to three, fifth cause of disability are related to frailty and also locomotive syndrome, uh, which was mentioned in my Noriko Yoshimura's talk. Uh, Frailty is also associated with the dementia and stroke. So if we can prevent frailty in our society, uh, I think we can end up with the uh, decrease of disabled older people in the future. So prevention, dementia, and frailty should be achieved by uh, physical mental health promotion. That's our goal. 
And actually, uh, the public health framework described in the uh, WHO, uh, World Report on Aging and Health, uh, introduced the concept of intrinsic capacity. WHO has uh, proposed this novel framework with the primary aim to optimize people's ability by focusing on comprehensive and more po uh, positive perspective of the aging process. Intrinsic capacity comprises all mental, physical capacity a person can draw on and includes the ability to walk, think, see, hear, and remember. The level of intrinsic capacity is influenced by several factors such as uh, the presence of diseases, injuries, and age-related changes. Frailty may be the other side of the coin of intrinsic capacity and is a clinical condition characterized by the individual's increased vulnerability to endogenous and exogenous stressors. Frailty and intrinsic capacity are two constructs stemming from the same need of overcoming traditional medical paradigms that negatively affect uh, older persons. Doesn't work. Doesn't work. Okay. Here is the key points. Here are the key points. Oh, sorry. Oh. Here are key points in frailty. Frailty is not an inevitable consequence, consequence of aging. Frailty is best thought of as, as a syndrome with multiple possible components rather than a single condition. People with frailty who experience an acute illness will have worse outcome than those who are not frail. Frailty is associated with several adverse health outcomes such as disability and death, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, metabolic syndrome, falls and fractures, polypharmacy, ER visit, and nursing home care, uh, home uh, placement, dementia, and complication after surgery. Okay, uh, we have the uh, two uh, aging cohort in our center. Uh, I'd like to show you one of them. Uh, the name is Niels LSA. Uh, this is a um, aging cohort, a longitudinal aging cohort uh, starting from uh, 1997. So the longest follow-up is more than 25 years. In this cohort, we are trying to address the um, uh, several uh, factors such as medical, psychological, morphological, uh, exercise, genetical, genetic, and nutritional factors on several uh, age-related outcomes such as malnutrition, fall fractures, mental illness, frailty, sarcopenia, locomotive syndrome, dementia, along with uh, death. Uh, this slide shows that uh, uh, which factor can affect uh, cognitive function uh, based on the longitude analysis. As you can see here, uh, higher index of short chain fatty acid and medium chain fatty acid are associated with uh, less cognitive uh, decline. Also, high intake of soybean and green tea are associated with uh, less cognitive decline in our cohort. And actually, I forgot to mention, our cohort contains a uh, uh, middle-aged group from 40 years old to uh, 70. This slide shows the factor related to uh, cognitive function again. And in this slide, higher intake of cereals and uh, lower intake of uh, daily product are associated with less, uh, sorry, the other one. Higher intake of cereal and uh, lower intake of dairy product are associated with cognitive decline. And this one showed the, uh, we also assessed the um, uh, dietary diversity using uh, quantitative index for uh, dietary diversity. As you can see here, uh, if uh, people intake a wide variety of uh, diet, uh, they can expect uh, less uh, cognitive decline in the long term follow up. There are several uh, healthy uh, lifestyles. Uh, as you can see here, healthy practice, no smoking, less alcohol consumption, higher physical activity, uh, moderate uh, length of sleep, um, uh, body shape, and dietary diversity, and also ikigai, and health checkup status. 
And if you have more uh, health-related uh, practice, healthy practice, they can expect uh, less uh, functional decline in the future. So I'm a I forgot to mention, I'm a geriatrician taking care of older patient. I always t uh, talk to my patient, uh, achieving lo a healthy longevity is not an easy task unless you have a very good uh, longevity genes. Uh, but uh, most of the case cases, uh, you know, your, uh, my patient coming to my clinic to see, to take care of multiple chronic diseases. So that possibility is quite low. So you need to follow or change your uh, lifestyle behavior. But uh, it's, as you may know, it's very difficult to change the lifestyle of a patient. That's why they are coming to my clinic uh, every month or every two or three months. So the, the, that we have evidence you know, to show them and they can understand uh, the importance of uh, the change of lifestyle modification, uh, the, the importance of lifestyle modification, but uh, the barrier is, you know, uh, it's hard to change their lifestyle, uh, especially in older people. So uh, we sh should think about the uh, uh, early introduction of a healthy lifestyle from uh, early life, like uh, medical, uh, uh, elementary school or junior high school, uh, something like that. This, back to, uh, this uh, data show the role of uh, depressive symptom and also employment after retirement affect the cognitive decline in the long term follow up. We followed uh, the participant uh, for more than 20, uh, 12 years. As you can see here, uh, the presence of depressive symptoms is associated with the future of cognitive decline and also unemployment after retirement uh, is associated with uh, cognitive decline in the future. But if you can continue employment at uh, work, work after retirement, uh, you, you have a high chance to keep your cognitive function in the future. So based on our cohort study, uh, following healthy lifestyle choices, such as non-smoking, having a healthy diet, and being physically active through mid to old age is associated with better health cognitive outcome and, and also physical outcome. Life transitions such as retirement may accelerate cognitive decline. So uh, we basically uh, ask other people to continue work, continue to work uh, as long as they can. Uh, I think in Japan, the um, uh, working uh, rate is higher compared to other countries, but still uh, they want to, uh, they have, we have a room uh, for other people to work in some uh, places. Not only physiological aspect, but also psychological aspects such as mental health and personality contribute to cognitive de uh, decline or outcomes. So in terms of frailty, uh, there's so many uh, assessment tools uh, for frailty, and there's no gold standard uh, for frailty assessment. And, but the phenotype model is useful for, to identify person for intervention. Uh, actually, I don't have enough time to explain about um, the Kihon checklist, but this checklist is useful to specify the target of intervention. This checklist is similar to uh, Locomo scale, uh, which was presented by Noriko Yoshimura, but a little bit different. Uh, it's focusing on frailty, not locomotive syndrome. And uh, we have uh, another kind of uh, assessment tool, which is frailty index. Uh, this is us useful for for big data analysis in a retrospective study design. So many people uh, use uh, this index uh, to identify the risk of each person, uh, patient based on the uh, chart uh, data, medical chart data. And frailty screening is recommended for most of the older people. So this is the uh, phenotype model, which was developed by Professor Linda Fried in the States. Uh, in this model, frailty is operationally defined as a clinical syndrome in which three or more of the following are present. The first one is unintended weight loss. Second is uh, self-reported exhaustion. Third, weakness. Fourth, slow walking speed. And lastly, low physical activity. This is the Japanese version of the CHS criteria, cardiovascular health uh, studies criteria, consisting of the same items, ranking weakness, slowness, and exhaustion, and low physical activity. We, 
but we specify the cutoff of grip strength and walking speed and also uh, weight loss. We should keep in mind that frailty is multifactorial in feature, in, in its character. In addition to physical uh, components, uh, psychological and social components should be assessed. Uh, so comprehensive assessment is uh, necessary, but I don't have to, today I don't have time to uh, introduce such data. Take time. Okay, uh, we have published several guidelines for physical frailty. This is one of them uh, with International Working Group. And this, in this guideline, uh, frailty screening is strongly recommended and also uh, along with assessment. And we need to develop a comprehensive management plan for frailty. And also in the terms of physical activity, uh, we have a strong uh, moderate, uh, sorry, a strong uh, recommendation for physical activity and also uh, nutrition and oral health are very important uh, component for frailty prevention. Actually, we have published uh, this guideline uh, by Asian Working Group for Sarcopenia. I'm the chairman of the Asian, uh, Asian Working Group for Sarcopenia last year. We have proposed 14 statements in six areas. Uh, one is from uh, malnutrition screening, diet and dietary patterns, nutritional supplements, lifestyle intervention, outcome assessment, and impact of COVID-19. In terms of diet, diet and dietary patterns, uh, opportunity for communal and social eating among older adults using a variety of food types may improve healthy eating, overall well-being, and muscle health with observance of public health measures for COVID-19. So COVID-19 affects a lot on older people. They, you know, we created uh, the problem of social isolation or living alone or eating alone. Nutrition counseling around good dietary practice for those at risk of malnutrition or sarcopenia should be provided by healthcare professional uh, prior, prior to dietary enrichment or supplementation. In terms of uh, uh, protein supplementation, we recommend 1.0 gram per kilogram per body weight uh, or more for a uh, healthy older adult. And for sarcopenic and frail older adult, we recommend one, more than 1.2 gram per kilogram uh, of body weight. We also uh, recommend reducing and l cutting and HMB. Uh, there's a limited, although it's uh, the limited evidence available, but uh, there's uh, some evidence to show uh, these agents is effe are effective for frailty prevention. Vitamin D is also important uh, micronutrient uh, in Japan or Japanese people have a lot of uh, vitamin D deficiency, especially in older people. Uh, according to Noriko Yoshimura's data, uh, more than 80% of older people satisfy the criteria of vitamin D deficiency. And also, young women have a higher incidence of uh, a prevalence of vitamin D deficiency because of you know, lots of uh, sunscreen and you know, avoiding sunshine. And in terms of lifestyle interve uh, intervention, Exercise and plus healthy diet are key for frailty prevention. And in terms of exercise, uh, uh, the program should consist of warm up, resistant balance aerobic training, and cool down. And we recommend this kind of exercise twice or three times per week. And where possible, the combined intervention should be provided, uh, preferably guided by trained personnel. So as you know, exercise and medicine uh, have a lot of effect on healthy out health outcomes, such as um, the improvement of sarcopenia, uh, decrease of falls, and improved QOL and ADL, and also effective for depressive mood. We have uh, published uh, this guideline by the, uh, with the international collaborators, and according to this guideline, uh, we should uh, recommend specific uh, exercise program like this, consistent, consisting of resistant training, aerobic exercise, and balanced training. So for the countermeasure for frailty and improving intrinsic capacity and well-being or the adult, we have five, we need five component. Uh, exercise and nutritional intervention are the key, but social participation is also important 
along with Ikigai. And or I didn't have a time to uh, mention, but oral care is very important. So we need to collaborate with dentists. And polypharmacy measures are also important measure for, uh, uh, for frailty. So in aging society, frailty and cognitive impairment are becoming big issues that need to be addressed. Frailty assessment and early intervention are required for healthy aging in, addi in addition to improving intrinsic capacity and well-being. We should increase the awareness of frailty and intrinsic capacity and provide a life course approach for the reduction of frailty, disability, and dementia. Actually, I'd like to announce or uh, uh, advertise the, uh, the IAGG, International Association of Gerontology and Geriatrics, Asia Estonia Regional Congress, next month in Yokohama. Uh, Dr. Toba is the chairman, and I'm the secretary general. And also, we are, I'm going to organize uh, the com uh, independent aging uh, exhibition and uh, convention uh, in October. This will be uh, organized, uh, held in IG Prefecture, right next to the, uh, the airport. And I'd like to acknowledge the people in the Niels LSA group, and thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Rai. Uh, there's already one audience who'd like to ask a question. Uh, <coughs> well, the, the most important uh, things, maybe, and uh, isolation and uh, dullness is a big factor. Maybe the you know, worst uh, risk factor for the long, you know, frailty, maybe. How do, you, uh, how do you think about yes, that? Yes, uh, uh, you're right. Uh, so especially during the COVID, uh, we, have, uh, we have observed a higher instance of frailty because of the social isolation, mm. uh, caused, which was caused by social restriction measures by the government. Mm. So we sh but that is very difficult to address mm. uh, in our society uh, because uh, you know, most of the people uh, live in a short, uh, unit, like mm. a uh, nuclear uh, family is increasing, mm. and the number of uh, other people living alone is almost four to five million in Japan. Yeah. So it's very difficult issue. So each government should uh, mm. think about how to address uh, to uh, mitigate mm. uh, social isolation in our society. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Uh, I th uh, anyway, the, you know, Mimisa Bea, the you know, Prime Minister, former Prime Minister of the England, he made, uh, he created a uh, minister of uh, frailty, also the loneliness. That's a wonderful thing. That, that may have not so political uh, things in the, uh, another country, maybe. Yes. But uh, I think that uh, isolation and the loneliness are very bad. The most, and uh, the worst uh, risk factor, those are. Uh, at, you know, stroke and uh, cancer and also the heart disease, maybe. Yeah, yeah. that's why we are here but to, you know, learn yeah. how to, yeah. uh, uh, you know, inhibit or mm. decrease social isolation in mm. uh, by learning uh, the lifestyle of in Okinawa yeah. people. Uh -huh. You know, he, you know, retire for the professor that position in the university, also the, you know, you know the master of the, the high school and the, the have uh, isolated after the retirement of their jobs, maybe. And, uh, one year or two, two years' time, we could be coming to the dementia and the bedridden condition. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Thank you very much Thank for you. your comment. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Rai, for an excellent talk. I have uh, just my. I wanted to thank you for the excellent talk, and I have a question from a more so societal perspective. So you clearly show that this demographic shift that occurs in Japan with a very high proportion of elderly, and Japan is unique in the world because of this currently high proportion of elderly, but Japan is also unique, as you mentioned, because many elderly want to work, uh, and we can see them as security guards mm -hmm. in, in the supermarket and so <laughs> forth. Yes. Uh, you have the 70-year-old security, <laughs> security guard. And I'm wondering, uh, is there a chance that, of course, you're going to see the, this demographic shift continue with a higher proportion of elderly, but is the willingness to work at an older age something that is held by a currently old generation so that in the future we have this double impact where people not only become elderly but also don't want to work because they have grown up under different values so that yes. there will be a double effect? Yes, there is an important point. And so uh, the definition of older people is 
uh, the same for the last w or more than 100 years, uh, 65 or over. Uh, some uh, countries adopt 60 or over, but um, uh, the life expectancy is getting longer. So uh, our society uh, proposed to change the definition of older people from 65 or over to 75 years or over. Then we might be able to overcome most of the you know problem in the aging society, but uh, there's some criticism <laughs> as well. So that's a, you know thank you very much for your comment. Thank you very much, Professor. Ah, okay, Suzuki Sen. How do you think about the Moai in Ogina? And so the same kind of things are done in the Korea. It is called the K. And so that's very kind similar things uh, some us in the United States. Don't want to eat that, maybe. Moa is kind of a you know, group eating or yes. e eating together, right? Yeah, yeah. Yes, yes, that's very important as well. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Rai. A great presentation. Now my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Richard Alsop from the University of Hawaii, from Honolulu. Uh, who will talk about telomere length as a cause of healthy aging and therapeutic potential of stem cells. Please. Thanks very much. Thank you, organizers, for the invitation. And it's great to be here. Uh, so this is the second last talk. We're in the final leg, and that's the good news. Um, but I have 30 slides to get through, and I've been asked by the interpreter to speak slowly. So that's the bad news. I'll do my best. Okay, so uh, my background is in stem cell biology as it relates to aging and telomere biology as it relates to aging. I'm not gonna talk much about stem cell or stem cell research other than just to mention a couple of projects that we have going. One is a collaboration with the San Diego Blood Bank where we are testing extracts that they have made from uh, neonatal uh, platelets and stem cells on their potential to activate telomerase and FOXO3. As we also have another project ongoing or starting to assess the interaction between adult stem cells, hematopoietic, skeletal, and neural stem cells, uh, and how uh, genetic effects can change that or modify that interaction, interaction as a function of age. So that's all I'm going to say about that. Uh, if you have any more questions about the stem cell research we're doing, let's talk about it over a beer later on. So uh, I'm gonna, today I'm going to focus on a study that uh, we did a few years ago, a little study here in Okinawa with collaborators, Dr. Goto Suzuki, uh, the Wilcox brothers, and uh, uh, Michi Shimabukuro and uh, Mortaki Higa. So this is a study of um, where we looked at the interaction of the FOXO3 longevity allele and its impact on uh, inflammaging and uh, telomeres. This picture here is a picture of Chaton. That's the American village. It's a great place, good Indian food. Good food overall, if you want to have a chance to go there, I recommend it. Okay, so the long-term goal of this is just to simply try to find ways to try to extend human health span and possibly maybe human will have maximum lifespan. Maybe the U.S. can catch up to uh, the Jap Japan average lifespan. So a little background on FOXO3. So FOXO3 is a transcription factor which uh, regulates various uh, processes in the body, metabolic processes, uh, tumor suppression, development, longevity, stem cell maintenance. Uh, so it was shown about 30 years ago in classic experiments by Cynthia Kenyon that the uh, ortholog of FOXO3 in C. elegans, DAF16, is essential for the lifespan extending effect of caloric restriction. If you knock out DAF16, you don't get the caloric restriction effect. And this is actually the insulin IGF-1 pathway, and this is conserved through evolution to humans. And then it was subsequently shown in the Wilcox lab uh, in Honolulu, uh, 2008, that there, the uh, human ortholog of DAF16, FOXO3, there is a variant which is robustly associated with human longevity. Uh, and as Brad mentioned yesterday, if you have one copy of this longevity-associated allele, the G allele, you have two times the odds to live to 100. If you have two copies, you have three times the odds. So we're trying to figure out how this works. Uh, and with any, um, you know, robustly, gene that's robustly associated with longevity, um, the frequency of, of the allele should increase, particularly in the elderly, uh, as you hit the extreme old age. And this is what, uh, um, this is what we have found, and many other labs have found this as well in different populations around the world. 
Um, so this, I'll just mention this uh, variant is not coding. It's not, APOE is a coding variant. It's associated with longevity. FOXO3 is non-coding. Um, and we've shown, I don't have time to show the data, but um, we know that uh, in, in uh, various studies that uh, this, this variant, if you have the GLEL, uh, the FOXO3 gene is more primed to increase in levels in, in response to stress. Um, so the inflammation theory of aging uh, it was first proposed about 20 years ago. It's a more modern theory of aging and uh, proposed by Claudio Franceschi and Judy Campisi, wherein various processes that um, around middle age begin to uh, promote chronic inflammation. So obesity, accumulation of senescent cells, different things, organ decay. And uh, that this process then drives the development and progress of age-related diseases. So we wanted to look at the effect of the FOXO3 longevity allele on chronic inflammation in our uh, study here in Okinawa. Um, so we looked at five, we measured five, uh, levels of five cytokines, IL-2, IL-1, beta, TNF-alpha, IL-10, and IL-6. And we found some interesting interactions between the FOXO3 longevity allele and two of those cytokines. So one of them is IL-10, which is a uh, anti-inflammatory cytokine, so a good one. So here it's shown in the top graph uh, with men. If you have a copy of the uh, G allele, as shown in by the blue line, uh, the, it, it actually, levels of IL-10 actually increases with age in the elderly. But we don't see this in women. So this is a fact that seems to be uh, particular to, uh, to men. Um, the other cytokine that we saw an interaction with is IL-6, which is an uh, inflammatory cytokine, so a so-called bad cytokine. And here in women, we see, if you have a copy of the FOXO3 G allele, levels of IL-6 uh, actually stay steady or possibly decrease with age uh, in the elderly, but we don't see this in men. So there seems to be uh, possible sex-specific effects of FOXO3 on uh, chronic inflammation. And that's all I'm going to say about that. Um, if you have any questions, we can have a, a beer later and talk about it later. So my background is actually in, more so in telomeres, and um, the slide sort of dates me a little bit, but it's a study, one of my first publications uh, about uh, 30 years ago, and uh, it, it, was, it, was, it was one of the publications that sort of launched the whole, uh, along with many others, uh, launched the field of telomeres and aging. So telomeres are these genetic elements that cap the ends of chromosomes. Uh, doesn't work too well. Um, so it's... Um, it's, uh, it caps it, protects it from uh, degrading and uh, keeps it stable so cro cro chromosomes don't uh, interact with each, with each other and do things that they shouldn't and form end-to-end -end associations. It keeps the ends of the chromosome stable, sort of like the end of a shoelace. If it gets frayed, it's, it's not good. Um, the enzyme telomerase, the shown here in the, in the, in the picture up there, uh, has two essential components, a telomerase reverse transcriptase, or TERT, and an RNA component purple squiggly line. So this, this enzyme is the only way that telomeres, well, pretty much the only way that telomeres can replicate and, and uh, maintain their length. So if a cell doesn't have telomerase, the telomeres short with age. And the mechanism is kind of an old figure, but that's how telomerase works. It docks to the three prime overhang of the telomere. It adds a few nucleotides, it dissociates, it extends a few more, and then does this repetitively over and over. But if you don't have telomerase, cells can't do that, and as a result, Telomeres tend to shorten with age, and it was shown uh, in the mid-90s, uh, and now classic experiments, that uh, um, if you add telomerase back to cells like human fibroblasts or human endothelial cells, oops, um, that telomere shortening stops and the cells don't senesce. So replicative senescence in humans and other species is due to, ultimately due to the shortening of telomeres. So in the study that we did in uh, with the Okinawan cohort, we uh, genotyped uh, the, the 350 participants, and then we looked, wanted to see the interaction, if there's any interaction between the FOXO3 longevity variant and telomeres as a function of age. And we found this interesting correlation as shown here. So if you have a, one or two copies of the FOXO3 G allele, the telomeres stay relatively stable with age. They don't shorten. But if you don't have a G allele, the telomeres shorten quite rapidly. And this is, I think, the first time that anyone showed an interaction between a, uh, a gene and telomeres, at least to this magnitude, as a, as a function of age. This is a cross-sectional study, by the way, and it's not longitudinal. 
Um, we also looked at the level of telomerase in our samples, uh, and uh, we found that in the elderly, the telomerase is uh, modestly higher than uh, in carriers of the FOX53 gelial as compared to younger donors. So that may account for the uh, effect of FOXO3 on telomeres. So that's, that's, that's the uh, end of that uh, study. So I'll just talk one, about one more study that we've done a little bit more recently, and uh, this is to look at the interaction between FOXO3 and resilience of cardiomyelobalic syndrome. So I believe the biology of aging, particularly with respect to resilience, is a highly understudied area of aging. I think we're going to see a lot more of it in the years to come. But resilience is just the ability to um, recover from a stress. So, you know, if you fall down and break your leg, you can recover quickly. And uh, when you're younger, if, you, if that happens to you when you're older, you might not recover as well. It could be, there could be some permanent damage. So I'll just put, summarize the data that I've presented to, to, uh, so far in this model. Um, in terms of, with respect to resilience. So, if you don't have a copy of the FOXO3 longevity allele, inflammation tends to increase more uh, with age. This drives cells to senesce. We know that chronic inflammation that can drive cells to proliferate, and particularly lymphocytes. Uh, and as a result, because lymphocytes don't have enough telomerase to maintain their telomeres, their telomeres shorten, and uh, uh, that's not good, telomeres become unhealthy. Whereas if you have a copy of the FOXO3 G allele, uh, chronic inflammation is reduced, not, not as much. Cells divide slower. Telomerase L levels may increase modestly, and telomeres uh, are maintained. Or you may think that they, be, they are resilient uh, with respect to age. So this last study I'll just talk about briefly. Um, we looked at the effect of FOXO3 longevity allele on cardiometabolic syndrome, and it's just, the results are essentially shown here. So this is done in the HHP cohort, the Honolulu Heart Program, and um, in people that do not have a, cardi uh, a cardiometabolic uh, syndrome, uh, which is the two curves, yeah, these two curves here, you can see that it doesn't really matter if you have a copy of the FOXO3 G allele or not. Uh, the, uh, the life expectancy, uh, the lifespan, uh, uh, mortality rate, I should say, just it doesn't seem to differ much. But if you have one or two, two one or more cardiometabolic diseases, these two lines down here, you have a higher rate of mortality. And if you have one or two copies of the G allele, uh, you have significant uh, uh, life, longer life. So the mortality rate is significantly reduced if you have one or two cardiometabolic diseases. So um, FOXO3 gene, the interpretation of this then is that the FOXO3 G allele um, provides some resilience to the progress of these cardiometabolic diseases. So in conclusion, um, so the longevity associated allele of FOXO3, the SNF is RS2802292, uh, it's one among the most strongly replicated findings in the genetics of longevity. Um, our recent research shows men with cardiometabolic disease who possess the longevity-associated allele of FOXO3 are resilient survivors. Uh, this association may be explained by altered transcription factor binding and or altered isoform expression. We have some data on this. And uh, sex differences in the genetics of aging research seem to be a little bit understudied. So, in particular, with the, with the Honolulu Heart Program I'm thinking of, which is uh, an entirely uh, male cohort, so it would be nice to replicate some of those findings in, uh, in women. So now I'll just talk a little bit here. Uh-oh. Next slide. No slide. Oh, there it is. Ha-ha! <laughs> there it is, my ikigai. <laughs> Beer. <laughs> Actually, any kind, <laughs> free. <laughs> actually, my ikigai, which I've developed recently and uh, actually been inspired by some people here in the audience, uh, David Lecouture and uh, Brian Craig Wilcox, is triathlon, so I'm getting into these. So I don't know how many of you know what a triathlon is, but it's a 1.5K swim, followed by a 40K uh, bike ride, followed by a 10K run. Um, so, you know, they, they say in, in Okinawa it's important important to walk 10,000 steps to maintain health. And so I just want to ask a quick question to the audience. So when I do my 10K run, how many people think I do more than 10,000 steps? 
One or two? How many think I do less? Oh. Winner. The answer is 9,000 steps for me. So it's close to 10,000, but not quite. But I can make that up walking to the gym. <laughs> Anyways, uh, I just want to acknowledge uh, the people, especially the collaborators here in Okinawa, uh, Dr. Suzuki, uh, 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 Michi Simabukuro, Craig Wilcox, Brad Wilcox, and others. Um, and uh, thanks very much, and let's go have a beer. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, excellent presentation. If we have any questions, or not, uh, we'll... Uh, Thanks, Rish. Very nice lecture. So, uh, I have a question regarding um, uh, a human disease model, and because it seems very clear from from the mice that you know, if we go back to, for example, caloric restriction, <coughs> then you have reduced GH, IGF one, uh, and this will in turn uh, 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 lead to. Um, uh, slower aging if you do that successfully. So have you looked at, because I, I'm fascinated by this IGF-1 coming up all the time because we've also seen that the level of growth hormone in the population mm -hmm. is a very strong uh, predictor of premature mortality. Mm -hmm. But we never understood what was the mechanism behind that. So uh, first, do you think, my first question is, is the uh, uh, IGF-1 or GH uh, just a some kind of marker of uh, something going on, or is it involved causally? Mm -hmm. And the second question is, um, have you ever looked at, you know, um, uh, FOXO3 in or uh, telomere or any marker of um, uh, advanced aging in patients who have acromegaly, who would have, you know, very, very high uh, growth hormone and IGF-1 drive, mm -hmm. uh, at least before they are treated. Mm -hmm. No, that's an interesting question. I'll ask the second question first. Uh, we haven't done that, but I think it would be quite interesting to look at. Um, um, I would presume that, uh, you know, if you have higher levels of growth hormone, your cells are going to turn over more rapidly, probably without telomerase. So I would expect probably a higher rate of aging in those people. That would be my prediction. So, but we'd be interested to look at that. We haven't looked at it. Uh, with regard to the uh, IGF signaling pathway, I think the reason that's popping up a, up a lot in different studies is because it's really important in terms of the body's response to nutri nutrition. In particular, uh, if calories are low, we know that caloric restriction is a major uh, driver of life extension. So it's one of the best uh, <clears throat> predictors of, of, of longevity if you reduce it. So, and it acts, I think it acts not all, entirely, but largely through the IGF-1 uh, 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 insulin signaling pathway. So I think, I, I think that's probably why it's popping up. Yeah. Thanks. Yep. Okay, no other questions. Thank you very much. Mm. Great. I'll take you up on the beer. So. <laughs> yeah. The so, uh, pleasure to introduce our final speaker, um, Craig Wilcox. And as you may remember, Craig uh, was kind enough to change. He was supposed to speak yesterday, but um, uh, we had a, a change in the program uh, due to, to uh, traveling. But I think it fits in very well to, to have you in the end, Craig, because uh, this, uh, uh, this, uh, the, the title of this talk kind of sums things up in a way. What have we learned about interventions and lifestyle change from half a century of research on healthy aging and longevity in Okinawa and other longevity hotspots? And Craig, as you know, is uh, affiliated with the uh, uh, Okinawa Research Center for Longevity and Science here in Okinawa. Please, Craig. Thanks for the nice intro, Oli, and, and uh, I'm very happy to be here, even though I just live down the street. Um, I've been spending most of my time in Hawaii recently, thus the aloha wear, which actually resembles Kariyushi wear, which this gentleman is wearing. So, yeah, I'm the last speaker, and uh, I changed my title a little bit. I was, um, I wanted to, you know, being the last speaker and all, kind of tie things together, but actually, that's your job, Oli, so I'm going to leave that up to you. And I want to talk from what I know about Okinawa, Hawaii, and w what we've been doing and for the last um, 30 years or so. Okay, without further ado, let's go.
All right, start from the beginning. Um, when I say R, I'm talking about me and my, my twin brother, Brad over there. He looks like he's falling asleep, but wake up, Brad. Um, how did we get involved with this project? Um, it's been like almost 30 years now. So this was how we got involved. Mr. Oyakawa, we were doing a study. We were working with Dr. David Jenkins, who uh, from, uh, uh, you certainly Frank knows him, a lot of co collaboration there. He's in one of the most um, recognized uh, researchers in, in uh, nutrition. And uh, he actually, well, we kind of cozied up to him. We were like, Brad was a young medical student at the time. I was uh, in graduate school and we wanted to go to Okinawa to look for the secrets of healthy aging and longevity. So we came up to, we call him DJ. We said, DJ, you know, we got this great idea and can you like pay for our trip? So he said, yeah, well, wow, I always wanted to go to the East, yeah, yeah. So that's what we did. But this couple, all right, who here is from Okinawa? Okay. All right. These two over here. Canadian, American, Okinawan, Japanese. Canadian. Oh, how did you know that? You're, you're right. Yeah, they're Canadian. But they emigrated from Okinawa. And they, um, they were part... Um, Mr. Oyakawa here, actually, both of them uh, came from Nago. They're immigrants to Canada, and it was very interesting. Because Mr. Sorry, Mr. O Oyakawa was uh, a, part a participant in our study of uh, nutritional factors and healthy aging that we had going at that time with uh, Dr. Jenkins. And uh, he was 105 years old. He lived to be almost 110, which is a super centenarian, right? And uh, he. Both of them were living a very traditional lifestyle in Canada in terms of an Okinawan diet and Okinawan lifestyle habits. He was like really kind of laid back and he's 105 and he would go out to the river near his house and be fishing a lot. So we were like, said, oh, we, we need to talk to Mr. Oyakawan and, and um, his name was Toko and this is Emmy. Um, and she was just a young thing. She's only 92, so I don't know. Maybe that's one of the secrets for longevity for men is to uh, have a young wife t that takes care of you. I might get busted for saying that these days, but anyway. They were our inspiration, and um, that's how it all started. And we started in 1994. Where's Dr. Suzuki? Okay, there he is. And here he is here. Bradley showed this, this slide earlier. I, I blew it up a bit. I mean, sorry for the, it's not a great picture, but this was 1994, so. Uh, we were like using very bad cameras and there were no cell phones. At least I couldn't afford one. So there's me and there's my brother, Bradley. And there's Makoto Sensei and the team at that time in 1994. And um, as you can see, when's that, about almost 30 years ago? See, you can look Makoto Sensei on me compared to 30 years ago. We haven't aged much, but if you look at my brother, or the, my twin brother, him living in America has really aged him. So that's one of the secrets. Okay, next. Okay, this is a typical field work site. Uh, Makoto Sensei and I, we used to go as a mobile team and we would go wherever the centenarians were, visit them in their own homes. And um, a lot of them lived in the countryside, you know, mountain, mountainous, this is a mountainous village, farming and fishing. You can see it's right there, the sea, the mountains. And this from the mountains is, all right, maybe, maybe only you know this one, Makoto Sensei. What did they tell you in elementary school about bringing your bento? <laughs> something from the mountains, which means like vegetables, and something from the sea. That makes up your bento, your lunchbox. My mother packed ham sandwiches for me. 
but um, I think it was healthier in Okinawa. So um, getting into, I'm going to be talking about the Okinawa diet a fair, fair amount today. So here's something from the sea. You know, I don't know how many people like octopus, but I kind of got used to it. These are like these little fishes that come up, and there's the Okinawan ladies. If you don't know, the, the women run the re religious system here, so and they're very strong. So um, all you men out there who are still single, careful if you marry an Okinawan woman. I'm speaking from experience. Okay, so next. So the, lots of houses like this, you know, like six rooms, they have these um, doors that they, they open up when they get up in the morning. So you see a lot of um, vegetable gardens. Everybody grows their own vegetables. All the older people, they get down there, they're gardening, they get lots of good workout, you know, in the, the legs, so. And um, a lot of these villages are, are depopulated rural areas, but well, I, I call it kin keeping or fictive kin. I, I uh, went to school, my first degree was in anthropology, then I went into public health and epidemiology after that, gerontology. But um, I noticed this behavior in the village that, that if the, these doors were not open, the, the younger elderly, say in their 60s, uh, would look over the older elderly, say in their 90s, and say, why isn't the door open? And there'd be all this kind of behavior going on, this exchange behavior. And the means of exchange, the most common means of exchange, was vegetables. Just everybody grew vegetables in their garden. So they'd go and they'd, they'd knock on the door, and they'd always bring something, bring vegetables. Hey, Grandma, you know, are you? and if she doesn't come, you know, and open the door, then they're going to be really worried, right? So they check, they kind of check on them. So you got these younger elderly looking after these very old elderly. And they're almost, some of them are kin related, but most are just, they grew up together in the village. They're like an auntie, uncle. Same in Hawaii, you call everybody auntie or uncle, even if you're not actually related. So that was very interesting as an anthropologist. And just a few shots. I got a lot of pictures here, so I'm going like, to whip through them, OK? So um, that's uh, me in my younger days. And this is the village head. And these are my students. This is a visiting student from a medical student from America. And um, all these other, they're nursing students. So I would take them into the village. And uh, we do th funky things like check blood pressure and do questionnaires and do a general health checkup. Basically, they were my, my free research assistants. So, um, yeah, they helped me a lot. But then they got a lot of good experience. This is a, uh, all right, you people from Okinawa, who's this lady from Wagimi? She's, uh, her name is... Uh, Taira, Taira Toshiko. She's uh, what's called a living human treasure. Although she recently passed away at the age of 100. She was um, running this, she was the main inspiration behind a, a traditional textile called bashofu, which they used to weave from the, um, the, the, uh, the fibers of the banana trees. Very interesting. And she, she was working up until uh, pretty well the the day before she passed away. So, and her uh, granddaughter was, was my student at the university here. So, I had good access to these older ladies in, uh, in uh, Ogimi. Very interesting. Now, Bradley already introduced our study, l the lifespan studies and health span, health span studies in uh, Hawaii, so I'm not going to get into that too much, but just to um, re-emphasize, we're looking at lifestyle and uh, genetic factors that predict healthy aging. And um, Hawaii, interestingly, I don't think you mentioned this, Bradley, um, has the highest life expect expectancy um, in America. This is kind of an old slide, so it's gone up since then, but just wanted to mention that. Um, shout out to our team in Hawaii. All right, now, other speakers have talked about caloric restriction. 
when we were talking about this 30 years ago, basically nobody believed us. But now you hear it all the time. You know, Walter Longo from, you know, and uh, Luigi Fontana, and actually today, Frank. Nice talk, by the way, Frank Hoop from Harvard. So colic restriction is basically the most powerful anti-aging intervention that we know of. I mean, yeah, we're talking senolytics, we're talking pharmacology, we're talking all this stuff in animal models, and we see some really good results with pharmacology. Brian Kennedy talked about that. But this is the strongest thing we have now. Now, that may be debatable, and I'm happy to talk to people later and debate about it, but um, it's pretty well the most powerful anti-aging intervention here. See, typical, these are, you know, monkeys and their brothers, calorie restricted, free access to food. Now, who would you rather be, this guy or this guy? Well, I don't know. I mean, you're living in a lab, so maybe you want to go out early like that guy, and you can eat as much as you want. But in terms of health, you can see the, ver the difference, and you see what the glucoregulatory impairment, zero, and the calorie restricted monkeys, neoplasia, cancer, half, cardiovascular disease, half. We know it works. I'm still trying to figure out all the mechanisms, lots of more work to do. Um, what you see in Okinawa is very interesting. What we, what we call a caloric restriction phenotype in old Okinawans. So is it genetic or environmental? You see these you know, lower blood sugar, lower percent of diabetes, type two diabetes, Higher HDL levels. They're smaller, they're leaner, less chronic disease. Just what you see in, you know, in, in when we calorie restrict mice or, or um, monkeys or human beings are now doing this, of course. There's all different ways. There's fasting, there's intermittent fasting. When I was a teenager, I used to read this book and it was called The Miracle of Fasting by a guy called, a guy called Bragg. He wasn't a doctor, um, but you know, I, I kind of ate it up, so to speak. I, I, I used to fast all the time, less so now. But um, there are health benefits to it. If you, you have to do it correctly, and um, you have to be careful if you're older, especially. So, but anyway, we know that it, 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 it's powerful. Foxo, well, Bradley and Rich, my um, co-conspirators talked a lot about Fox. So, uh, actually, I think you guys both showed this slide, but I want to just, you know, focus in on these two areas, longevity, stem cell maintenance, stress resistance, you know. Fox is in a gene neighborhood, got lots of friends that all influence the aging process. So that's what, all I'm going to say about that. And uh, this is interesting because if you look at um, all core all cause mortality in very late life. Look at, say, inflammation or anemia, liver function, lipid glucose, telomeres. Sorry, Rich. Not telomeres. Inflammation predicts all cause mortality in very late life. Now we all know, we're talking about that. You know, a lot of speakers talked about inflammation and inflammaging putting together inflammation and aging, and inflammation at the cellular level, chronic low-grade inflammation as driver, as a driver of the aging process. So, all right, something here just to mess with you guys. What's that? Oh, come on, somebody must know. Just wants to give <laughs> Not you guys. <laughs> oh, Hydra. Oh, what's that got to do with aging? <laughs> okay, all right, you're right. Yes, basically, um, Hydra are, they're immortal. Why are they immortal? Well, our friends from the Max Planck Institute wrote this very interesting paper in, uh, published in Proceedings of National Academy of Sciences in 2012. And they, what they wrote here is just what it says, you know. FOXO is a critical regulator of stem cell maintenance in immortal hydra. And if you ablate FOXO, guess what? 
your pool dries up, no more stem cells. So, you know, just like we saw here, you know, go back. Stem cell maintenance, there we go. So, quite interesting. Bradley, you also talked about this, so I'm not gonna go into this. FOXA works as an aging hub. We, we, we published this in Aging Cell in 2017. Our um, geneticist, Tim Donlan, he's a, a master, master, you know, he's out in another world. But um, can I say that he, he can't write so well? <laughs> but he's a thinker. So um, we work as a team and um, he found this, look it up, this is a great paper. It's really, really funky. Brad, you know, talked about it earlier, so I'm gonna move on. All right, so, <sighs> mortality pr protection in FOXO3, how does it work? Again, I'm gonna just whip through this because both of you guys have talked about it, so. Since uh, both of these guys talked about it, you guys should just be shouting out the answers so you, I don't have to drone on about this, you know? CHD, coronary heart disease, the main effect, if you have one of the two protective alleles. You're, you're, you're heterozygous, we put the, the homos and the heteros together. Might not work in a bar, but it works in the experiment. So, and if you had one of the protective alleles, you know, decreased risk for coronary heart disease, so. Why is FOXO3 connected to longevity? I mean, it's a common allele. Everybody has the FOXO gene. 30% of you in this room have one of those protective alleles. And by the way, none of you are leaving before I get a blood sample, okay? So just keep that in mind. Okay, uh, can a single gene meaningfully impact human longevity? Yes, it can. We worked with the Health ABC study we combined the blacks, whites, and Japanese, men and women, and here's the combined analysis. So you see the risk goes down. Now it's different, there's a lot of variability you know, uh, in, in, in s some of the samples, but you combine them, it's good to have high numbers. And you, you see, yes, it can, that's the, the answer. And okay, this is population attributable risk for all you epidemiologists out there, you know exactly what I'm talking about. So if you're looking for risk factors in a population, the Japanese, the number one risk factor in our Honolulu Heart Program population, this one is only men by the way, is the lack of one of the GLEOs. S the same strength as hypertension, and you know what a problem Arai Sensei, hypertension is in Japan, um, it's the same, look at that. So every population is different, um, so there's different, uh, how should we say, levels or, or you know, populations that everybody has the, the, some populations have say more of the G alleles, more of the, the, the double G alleles, homozygous, um, or the, just the TT or genotype. So, but you see this, but you see the same thing. Look, here in the whites from the health ABC population, it's the number three risk factor. After hypertension, pretty well almost the same as smoking. And then in blacks, it was number two. Hypertension was number one, but FOXO. So um, you might wanna get tested for that if you're worried about cardiovascular disease, particularly the coronary artery disease. And we talked about this, FOXO3 and inflammation, inflammaging, is it the smoking gun? So uh, we, here we see, again, we combined the, uh, where's my, the, the G and the T's together, the GG, so the heteros and the homos are together, and the TT's are over here. You know, higher levels of uh, C-reactive pro protein, you know, one measure of inflammaging. Next. Oh, this is my karate sensei. Does anybody know him? That's Weihara sensei. So he, at this point, he was 97. So, and um, you might like this, Rich. 
Uh, we we used to do this um, karate. He's got a dojo in um, in Ginawan, and uh, we used to practice on on the on the beach, on Araha Beach, which is well close to Ginawan. And um, he was tough. He was 97. Look at him. I mean, okay, we didn't go full on with him, but he was he was pretty tough. And um, after every karate session, our practice, doing our kata, messing around, he had this big sword too. He's it like a dangerous dude. Okay, okay, here's what you, you're gonna like about this, Rich. After every practice session, he, he used to pull out the Orium beer. Are there any Orium beer sponsors here? Because, you know, this could be good. You know, drink Orium beer, you live longer. Okay, anyway. All right, so these are some, some um, books we wrote. Basically, our first book about it was the 25th anniversary of the Okinawa Centenarian Study in Makoto Sensei and Bradley and I kind of summed up the data and we, we made a, an intervention program. Since I'm in, in, in the intervention side of things, something that the uh, the general public could react to. You know, like Blue Zones. People love the Blue Zones. It's sexy, you know? So we tried to, you know, make it sexy. We had the Okinawa Way, how to improve your health and longevity dramatically. But um, the Europeans in England, this is how it was published, as the Okinawa Way. And that was our title. We loved that, right? Then Random House comes to us and they say, can't, you know, what is this Okinawa Way thing? You know, can't you, like, have like program in the title somewhere? We're like, you know, I was really insulted, you know, like, no, it's the Okinawa way. And they said, well, you know, Barnes and Noble and the other publishers will triple their orders if you put program in the title somewhere. And we're like, okay, it's kind of a, uh, this is, I'm kind of liking that now. So we, we sold out and we, you know, the American version was the Okinawa program. And actually, you know what this, okay, you, Arai Sensei, what does that say? These two kanji together. Oh, choju, what does it mean? Okay, all right. You know, the, the first printing had this kanji and that kanji. So they had cho, cho, so long, long. <laughs> Which, okay, they're, they're Americans, they don't get, you know, kanji. And here's my favorite one. This is how it was published in Italy. I mean, I think that's the most, all right, can I have a vote here? Who th agrees with me? This is the best cover. Come on, you Italians. You got a sense of fashion. <laughs> Can't not read, this is, this is published in Italian. Oh. <laughs> All right, all right. I might have one in the trunk of my car. I have old copies that I kind of sell to support my, my uh, nefarious lifestyle. But um, all right, but yeah, I liked it. I loved that. You know, the Italians have this fashion sense. I mean, look at the man here. Here I am, you know, I'm like my sandals, you know, aloha wear, but hey, this is Okinawa and Hawaii, you know. I just came off the beach in Honolulu, so. All right, so, uh, Dr. Hu, you talked about this. We worked together to, to uh, redesign the Asian food pyramid, which if um, Frank gave a very nice slide on that, and if you look um, under Old Ways, which is a, um, an organization, a foundation that promotes traditional eating patterns, including the Mediterranean diet. Walter Willett's involved with that. He's on the board. I'm sure you are too, Frank. And, um, but. I gave my input, and uh, this mostly I, I took it from our experience with the Okinawa food pyramid, which we designed here. But um, yeah, the Asian diet and the Okinawa diet are similar. We wrote a paper, sorry, I'm not gonna show it today, but um, we were asked by uh, an Italian colleague, do you know him, Franceschi? Yeah, okay. So he asked us to, uh, you know, he's the guy, uh, as you know, 
turn, you know, put aging and inflammation, these immunologists, you know, aging and inflammation together, inflammation aging. So he was doing a special issue in um, mechanisms, mechanisms of aging and development and asked us to write a paper. So our, the title of the paper was Healthy Aging Diets Other Than the Mediterranean. So we talked about the Okinawa diet, and we had our little food pyramid in there. But if you look at it, you know, it's very similar to most aging diets. The typical diet in Okinawa, pre-war period. Uh, can I skip this, Brad? How much time we got, Ollie? I don't want to drone on forever. <laughs> okay, I'm going to cut to the chase here. This is a paper we published in JAMA um, from our data in, uh, in uh, from the Honolulu Heart Program in men. It was a special issue on men's health, and this was the lead paper. And uh, we got a lot of press with this, so you might want to check it out. It's a long time ago, though. But we had these 10 major risk factors that we looked at. Um, and here they are, hyperglycemia, hypertension, high alcohol, low education, overweight, poor diet, uh, high triglyceride, low grip strength, ever smoker, and this these are men, unmarried risk factor for men. Doesn't seem to be for women. Can you help me with that one? Why is that? In Japan, and my wife's um, Japanese, she says a good husband is healthy but absent. I'm not quite sure how to take that. Maybe we can talk about that later. Okay, so anyway, th wh what we did is we looked at men uh, in their mid-50s, average age of about 55, and um, looked at these risk factors. Well, we have John Grove, our biostatistician, came up with this funky no model, and we, we've, the ones that came out the strongest here, okay, well, all right, let's forget about that. We're talking about the number of risk factors here, all right? So as you may expect, um, if you have zero risk factors um, at age 55, and this is living in a healthy survival, so free of age-associated disease, which we defined um, um, later. I'll tell you about that if you're interested. So the point is with this is um, the number of risk factors, that they're, they're, they're cumulative, which makes sense. But it was a model that we could predict how they would survive 20, 30. Later, we pushed it out 40 years based on these risk factors. So I guess JAMA liked it because it's the lead paper in the special issue on men's health. So, but it, it it was it was interesting. And uh, okay, since I'm the last speaker, I want to show a few pictures. Okay, when I was doing s studies up, um, I was actually living in the village. You know, I, I went back to my anthropological roots. So I was a, I was an honorary member of the Gateball Club. See, that's one of their icky guys up there. This one doing bashofu, so she used to thread from the, you know, very happy. Um, here's the question, and Frank, you addressed this one, so I'm just gonna whip through this. Basically, there's a lot of similarities between these blue zone diets. So who talked about that? All right, and um, so I'm not going to talk about one point is vegetable heavy, very important. Lots of legumes as well. And uh, what we found a lot of CR, caloric restriction, mimetic foods. So you, you get some kickback from, from these healthy foods through the mechanism of caloric restriction, partially activating FOXO3. And the, I'm not sure that everybody knows this, but the main Carbohydrate in the o traditional diet is sweet potatoes. This is, um, you know, astaxanthin, turmeric, green tea. The Japanese diet and the Okinawa diet are very different. Japanese diet, rice based, Okinawa diet, traditional diet, um, sweet potatoes. All kinds of them purple, yellow, orange, lots of polyphenols. So foods like this, dishes like this. This is um, bitter melon, um, nijana, greens. So many greens, so many orange, green, orange, yellow root, leafy green vegetables. 
tofu, lots of tofu, not so much meat. The traditional diet, I mean, who could afford meat? Now, I ask you this, is, isn't it strange that you can go to a supermarket and meat is uh, cheaper than a sweet potato? Something wrong there. So here are the key features, low caloric density, plant-based, low fat, moderate protein, soy fish, lean meats, high nutrient density, phytonutrient rich, low in glycemic load, anti-inflammatory. You want a healthy aging diet other than the Mediterranean? Here it is. But actually, you know, the, the features that they share are, are very similar. The foods, of course, are different, but the main features are very, very similar. Sweet potatoes. And these are good. When I, got every, when I usually give a talk in, in North America and people on the American diet, I say, well, look, the USDA says Americans lack sufficient amounts of dietary fiber, calcium, magnesium, potassium, and the antioxidant vitamins A as carotenoids C and E. Well, guess what? That's everything here that Americans lack is here in the sweet potato. So I just tell them, eat more sweet, sweet potatoes. They do in the South, but they usually kind of make pies and that out of them. I just get them from the sweet potato truck. But, uh, and you look at the glycemic index. In the early 90s, before the glycemic index went worldwide, Bradley and I were sitting in Dr. Jenkins' lab, getting our fingers pricked, and measuring our, the, the, our, our, our response to, to eating carbohydrates. We thought that was really funky at that time. And we said, DJ, that's his name, yeah. David Jenkins, DJ, this is gonna go big someday. You gotta patent this. He said, oh, I know. I'm a scientist. I'm not a businessman. Like, okay. And what happened? It went big, it's everywhere now. So, uh, this is interesting though. The sweet potato is a GI 55, which is kind of medium or, or just slightly low, depending on how you cook it. But um, here, this is what most people eat, is the so-called Irish white potato. Uh, 90. Stay away from those. But you know, you can go now to most restaurants and get sweet potatoes. The problem is that older Okinawans only eat them. Younger people don't eat so much of them. This is the sweet potato truck, by the way. Yakimo. That's me. You notice that I'm all alone? Stops in front of my house every Sunday. And um, they play a little song, you know. Oishi, sweet potato. Oishi means tasting, right? And then he stops right in front of my house because he knows that I'm going to go out there and buy five or six sweet potatoes. But my neighbors don't come up. So that tells you something. The foreigner is buying them. All right. So astaxanthin. Um, you're talking intervention. It's a xanthophil uh, carotenoid present in microalgae. Why am I talking about astaxanthin? Because there's a, this company, which, by the way, I bought, uh, okay, I bought stock in this company, and I consult for them, so I'm, I'm telling you my, my conflicts of interest here. In the meantime, the stock went from about, I don't know, $2 to, what is it, almost zero now? Uh, so you might want to buy it now, unless they go bust. But anyway, the, the, the whole idea was to take astaxanthin, um, which has demonstrated this efficacy in all these models of aging, mainly inflammatory based, and turn it into a, a medicine. So far they've come up with a supplement, which again, I take daily, but um, everybody has their own routine. I'm not David Sinclair, and I'm not gonna tell you what I take other than this. Okay, next. This is something really funky we did in Rich's lab. What we did was we want to see how, what happens if you feed astaxanthin to mice. And guess what we saw? Uh, it increases FOXL3 expression by 90%. All right, what are we looking at here, Rich? The heart, the liver. So these are, uh, Okay, all right, I, I gotta go on. I'm, I'm just out of time here, so. Again, acid, uh, the antioxidant activity, very strong. Better than vitamin E, beta carotene, lutein, lycopene. 
Okay, now I'm, I'm finally at the last slides here. This is uh, what we thought was we uh, thought, well, if the traditional Okinawan diet is um, so healthy, and it's one of the reasons Okinawans live so long, let's feed it to Americans. See what happens. And we, so we applied to the uh, Mambu Kagaksho, which is um, one of the main funding agencies in, in Japan for uh, research. And um, they gave us money to do it. It was wonderful. A lot of money. And um, so here, you know, we're just, here. so we put out the word to the Americans living on, um, in Okinawa, mostly teachers. And uh, we had all these volunteers. You know, and then this is the ex explanation meeting, and then here are some of the traditional vegetables. And so how do we do it? Well, eh, Americans don't like to cook, right? So we cooked for them. We made vacuum pack bentos. So this is a, a meal. Here they are. They get, used to get a delivery once a week. So they had, you know, on the weekend, they could, like, take it easy, and, um, you know, we gave them... Uh, bitter melon juice and mix it with apple juice because it's bitter. Surprisingly, most of them drank it. Plus, we gave them a copy of one of our books. There's lots of recipes. They try and stay on the program on the weekend, you know, but you can't be on the program too long. But anyway, these are some of the bentos. So, next. Guess what we saw after this intervention program? By the way, you know, a little washout period here, and then, then at group A, group B, uh, it's a randomized crossover design, so that here, group A um, goes on the intervention. You see the blood pressure start to drop. At this point, they change. Uh, group B, they're, they're on their regular diet, you know, and then they go on the Okinawa diet. So it's a, it's a beautiful result. I sound like Donald Trump. It's beautiful. Okay, anyway. What we saw is DASH-like uh, blood pressure reductions in Americans. Everybody knows the DASH diet, right? Dietary approaches to st stop uh, hypertension. So and this is the most commonly prescribed uh, diet to lower your high blood pressure in, in America. And we, this is a, just a, it's not a diet designed by research to lower your hypertension. It's a natural diet. Yeah, and guess what? We get the same result. You know, very similar results. All right. Now, this is me. And Makoto Sensei, you showed the slide yesterday, right? See, here, this is before I went on the Okinawa diet. You know, kind of like a little heavy around the waist, and my breasts are sagging. And But this young lady, she wasn't quite 100. She, I think she was 105 at that time, but she lived to be 110. That's Dr. Suzuki and one of our research assistants. Obviously, calorie restricted. This woman, she, look at her, she's so tiny. Um, now look at me. Here, look at this picture. I lost this whole bunch of weight. So, and then we wrote this book, The Okinawa Diet Plan. So, um, this is my last slide, I think. So, I, I thought it would throw in some shameless self-promotion here. So this is it. But it actually, it works pretty good. So here, conclusions. As we all know, chronic low-grade inflammation is a major determinant of aging rate longevity. Recent research has discovered important genes like FOXO and pathways hubs that regulate the aging process. Nutritional approaches, flavonoids, polyphenols, omega-3 fatty acids, calorie restriction. Very important. They're also pharmacological strategies. So what we've learned about aging in the past 30 years is just amazing. And the Okinawa diet has a lot of this, this stuff. Yeah. I think we should compare the Mediterranean diet to the Okinawa diet and see what happens. In fact, they I recently saw a paper, um, some Norwegian scientists put, Okinawa, put uh, some diabetes patients on the Okinawa diet and got really good results. I'm not gonna show it today though. I'm done. This is it. Thank you. Thanks. Sorry to drone on for Thanks so long. Lot, I know Craig. you're all tired. Thank you. Um, any questions in the audience? 
I think uh, you, you did sum it up very well. So uh, you made my job <laughs> easy. Or you, you, d you made my job. Okay, so you're going to buy me a beer later. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank and you. some Okinawan uh, <laughs> Okinawan one. potatoes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Michael, oh, but uh, I have just a, a final one. So w sure. w one, uh, I don't know if, if you have that data, but... So and I and I understand that the the um, Japanese uh, uh, immigrants to uh, Hawaii are from all over Japan, obviously not only from Okinawa. Um, but do you have any compar comparative data between uh, Japanese living in Hawaii and Japanese living in Japan, or rather in ok Okinawa? I mean, are is for example. Uh, and you show that Hawaii is doing well in terms of American standards in longevity, but but uh, is is there more obesity or any other de measurable risk factors or even the opposite in the Japanese community in um, in in your study in uh, Hawaii of Japanese and if you compare them with a representative population in Japan? Okay, no. that's a very good question. Thank you. Now, um, all questions should be um, directed to the smart guys in the group, Rod and Rich. <laughs> but what I know about things, maybe you guys want to pipe in here, is, uh, I mean, that's, that was the whole um, reason for the Honolulu Heart Program, because it started out as the Nihon San study, Ni being Nippon, Japan, Hon being Honolulu, and San being San Francisco. And it was a study of acculturation and, and uh, cardiovascular disease. What happens if you take Japanese out of Japan and put them in a completely different environment? Like, say, Honolulu or, or um, San Francisco. And what we found was, well, <laughs> the longer they're, they're there, one generation, two, three, the more they take on, which is not surprising, the, um, the diseases of their shall I say, host nation, you know, wh where they've emigrated to. So some of the, th the first things we learned, if you go through the history of the Honolulu Heart Program or the Nihon San study, which was the original, what it was called, um, some of the first things we knew about um, cardiovas cardiovascular disease came out of that study. Cholesterol, the importance of cholesterol. And what did we know about cholesterol in 1965? Oh, there's some good cholesterol now, and there's some bad cholesterol. Oh, okay. All right, you know? Oh, butter's good, or margarine's good, or you know, what types of fatty acids are good? So this was a time in the 60s. <laughs> Another reason why it started out as only men, because only men got cardiovascular disease. I mean, it's not. I mean, it's an exaggeration, but way more men than women in those days. So, yeah, that, yeah we have lots of data on that. So to an to answer your question, I could go drone on for a lot longer, but no, there is, is more work to do there. So <laughs> at least we have uh, begun. <laughs> okay. So thank you very much. Thank you so much. <laughs> oh, one, just one. Lifestyle trumps genes. We've got to add that one in there because they're all you know genetically homogeneous populations, right? Uh, I mean. Thanks. So I think uh, we, we have um, now come to the end of this meeting. And, um, um, you know, let's go back from where we started. This, the, the, the aim here is really to um, stimulate uh, new collaborations. I, knew, I know that there have been um, uh, many discussions during dinners and so on that will lead to new uh, papers, new knowledge. That's one of the key aims of the K Symposia. Uh, and um, uh, I think the, the Journal of Internal Medicine uh, also, um, w um, uh, there will be review articles from this symposium. Uh, there will also be the, the, the symposium will be uh, recorded, uh, or it is recorded and it will be available after the meeting. So what I'm saying is I'm hoping that um, the um, trying to 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 put all this quite heterogeneous uh, research um, 
uh, talks together in promotion of healthy aging. It's not easy, but uh, I'm, I'm very uh, happy with how it ended, uh, ended up. And uh, again, please uh, 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 follow up uh, through Jim. And remember, as um, the editor-in-chief, Buan Yelin, said the first day that uh, Jim really uh, uh, it's a broad scope of the journal, but the, 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 uh, our favorite is overarching research, like internal medicine is in practice, and also overarching in the sense that to combine experimental and clinical data, and I think we have seen a lot of examples of that uh, on this meeting. So, so, so I would like to, to thank uh, the Journal of Internal Medicine and the Swedish Royal Academy of Sciences for, for uh, uh, arranging this meeting. Uh, I would also again like to, to thank Professor Suzuki for everything uh, and also like to thank uh, my co-scientific organizers, Thomas and Ako, and um, uh, we had, had uh, 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 Sasaki-san and Yamaguchi-san, who are uh, uh, the, the local OCVB organizers, and they have done a fantastic job, so uh, without them, uh, nothing of this could have happened either. So, uh, you are probably now uh, uh, a little bit tired, but you, I hope that the meeting will contribute to your healthy aging, and maybe you can choose to do the triathlon or go and have a beer, or maybe, w maybe not beer first and triathlon after, but hopefully triathlon and then the beer. That, I think, is a good combination. So, um, with these words, uh, thank you so much um, uh, to everyone who has uh, been speakers and have been listening here. And uh, hope you enjoy the rest of your uh, stay. And, and if you're traveling out again, uh, a good uh, journey back. Thank you so much.